Think, uh, think of the growth and the success of the state of Texas and San Antonio over the last more or less 30 years. Now think of the growth and success of Frost Bank over the last 30 years. You guys see a pattern? You add to the equation Dick Evans, and I think you'll see the pattern becomes pretty clear. Steady, visionary, a bit of a maverick, and certainly not afraid to make their own path. You know, that speaks to what Texas, San Antonio, and our largest native bank have in common, but also its CEO since 1997, I guess, and the only leader Frost Bank has had in almost 130 years, his name wasn't Frost. Uh, like his bank, Dick is from here. Uh, and by the way, if you don't think Dick is a real Texan, you need to meet his wife, Jimmy Ruth. Uh, for many of us who cannot hold a job, Dick is unique uh, compared to us. Dick's had two employers in the last 40 years. Uh, besides a little time teaching school, he worked for the control of the currency out of college. And then he's been with Frost Bank since 1971. Dick and I were leaders from San Antonio together about 120 years ago. Um, and um, the scary thing about Dick, one of the scary things about Dick is literally he's not, he's a little greater, but otherwise he's not any different today than he was in 1978 when first I met him. Back then, Frost Bank was getting ready to brag that they were one billion dollars strong. Don't mess with my willy. Today, with Dick at the helm for the last 15 years, Frost is pushing $20 billion strong, 110 branches, and is a legendary presence in banking circles uh, in Texas and the nation. In no small part because in the hallowed TARP days, which all of you may remember fondly, um, Dick and the bank said thanks but no thanks to the federal bailout money. They didn't need it, didn't want it, because they're from here. There's a bunch of One of the 10 top banks to refuse to engage in residential mortgages and credit card loans. One of the best expressions and mottos I've heard Dick use over the years is, boring has been beautiful. So if you think about this, with all the turmoil and carnage we've seen in the financial services industries over the last several decades, what bank and what bank leader better defines steady, solid, good growth, good corporate citizenship, and concentrating on meeting the needs and cares of its customers and its communities. What bank says that better than Frost Bank? Also, smart folks around this community have turned to Dick uh, in a host of other ways. He has served on the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas uh, to a host of community groups. He's been everything from the chairman of the United Negro College Fund, the San Antonio Livestock Exchange, to the United Way. The common denominator is they have all prospered under his guidance. Before coming here this morning, I spoke to several people about what I should say about Dick and what I should not say. Uh, the what I should not say was really not very large, although I'll be happy to share with the newspaper <coughs> after the comments today. But what really intrigued me was what the common denominator was, what people said I should say. Um, same thing I said when I first started. Steady, smart, not afraid to buck the trend and go his own way, and very de dedicated. But one of the common denominators that everyone said was that Dick doesn't normally agree to give these kinds of presentations so that it, when you're here today, you need to listen. Because the common denominator that everyone said is that when Dick Evans talks, people listen. It's my great honor to introduce and call for the chairman and CEO of Color Cross Bankers and as good a friend of this community as anyone who has ever stood before you, the Honorable Richard W. Evans. I want to say that he warmed you up for me as I came up here. I think he just made me nervous. Uh, I was thinking as he was talking, if some folks from Uvalde that I grew up with, they would think it's somebody else he's talking about. The, uh, you know, it's great to be in San Antonio. It's been a great place and still is a great place for me to raise a family and spend my working life. And as I was driving down here today, 
I couldn't help but think about the people that are driving to a city for the chamber meeting in California, Arizona, Florida, how depressing that would be to, to have to go to something like that and how fortunate we are to be in this great city. You know, there's, there's all due respect to Express News and I like the discussion about, uh, about local news because that would be very positive. But if you watch much television, uh, I think you can get pretty depressed if you watch it across, see what's happening in our nation today. So I've got a little helpful hint for you. What I would suggest you do is spend more time on the Food Channel. You'll find that not to be depressing. But certainly we are so blessed to be in this great state of Texas. We live in a business-friendly state, blessed with natural resources, and most important, entrepreneur people who have a can-do spirit, can-do attitude. The sense of community pride in San Antonio is what we need more of in Washington and in our country today. Along these lines, I recently read a, a great book called The Gardens of Democracy by Eric Liu and Nick Hanauer. Using the metaphor of society as a garden, the writers emphasize citizenship and the needs to tend the garden of communities through deeds, both large and small. The writers say that the foundational values of great citizenship are a mutual responsibility, a willingness to put the long term over the short term, an ethic of contribution over consumption, and these qualities at times are in short supply today. In the private sector, capitalism to many has even become a dirty word. That's due in part by the collective loss of virtue. A recent Wall Street Journal article said that we as Americans used to believe and teach initiative and hard work as virtues, along with self-restraint, personal integrity, and a concern for others who depend on us. Freedom carried a moral obligation to act in a certain way. That obligation extended beyond paying the tax bill to a principled stewardship of others and our liberty. Unfortunately, we've seen that government is incapable of filling that vacuum of virtue in the private sector. This is especially true in Washington where elected officials too often focus on the next election rather than the next generation, kick the can down the road rather than address tough issues like the national debt and deficit spending, and appeal to the political base rather than work across the aisle to solve problems. The CBO projects a $1.2 trillion deficit in 2012, a $10.7 trillion deficit over the next 10 years, and our national debt just passed $16 trillion. This is 16 with 12 zeros. You know, I'm a banker. I don't know what trillions and billions and millions and all these things are, but I get a little confused. So let me see if I can help you if you get confused. A trillion is a million millions. We hear so much about these millions and billions and trillions that they do run together. So think in terms of time for just a minute, as in 60 seconds in a, in a minute. One million seconds equals to 12 days. One billion seconds equals to 31 years. One trillion seconds equals to 31,688 years. And our politicians talk about trillions like it's play money. Our elected officials in Washington are literally destroying the future of the country by refusing to tackle our budget deficit and the national debt. We're staying afloat because foreigners have been willing to buy our treasuries to finance us. 
but that's a mixed blessing because it allows our politicians to be physically irresponsible. It's gotten to the point that leaders won't even pass budgets for fear of taking a tough political position that the other side could demagogue for political gain. I'll be back. I'm gonna go eat. They can't stand the heat, but they're still in the kitchen making a mess. And the buck used to stop with Harry Truman, and now it's being thrown around like a hot potato. We need courageous leaders today who will stand up and do what's right for the long-term good of this country. With effective leadership comes clarity, and clarity is what business owners need in order to create jobs. While small businesses are responsible for two-thirds of the job growth in the United States, they also have a higher rate of failure than larger companies. Their ability to grow has been hampered by more than 4,000 regulations that are currently in the works. Uncertainty and overregulation are job killers for businesses of any size. Companies can adjust their business models when they know what the rules are. But it's impossible to develop an effective business strategy when the rules are continually changing. There are many examples of this, but let me start with the banking industry. Many bankers, including those of us at Frost, are spending a lot of time in meetings about Dodd-Frank financial reform legislation. Two years ago, after the law was passed, we still don't know what the rules are and how they will be applied. There's still more than 100 rules from Dodd-Frank legislation that are waiting to be interpreted by regulatory agencies. When fully implemented, Dodd-Frank will be devastating to the banking industry and particularly to community banks as they bear a disproportionate share of the compliance burden. At no time in the history of our country have we had sustained economic growth without a healthy and growing banking industry. Making major changes to Dodd-Frank would be a great place to start to help to restore our economy. Banks are also dealing with something called Basel III, in which making community and regional banks that have had nothing to do with the financial crisis adhere to some capital requirements that are the same as the too big to fail banks. It significantly increases the amount of capital banks have to put aside for certain loans. This will reduce the amount of the bank's availability to lend, further hampering the economy. We are working with other regional and community banks to extend the comment period. As part of serving on the Federal Advisory Council, I meet quarterly with Chairman Bernanke and representatives of the Fed District. In fact, I'm headed up this afternoon to Washington. I will tell you that I'll be careful when I, before I get back in time to take a good shower in Clorox so none of that stuff sticks on me. Also, I need one moment of disclosure. I'll make a comment about what I think the Fed's doing. I don't speak for the Fed. I only speak for my opinions. With that in mind, I think that we're dead wrong to be further easing. I also commend my good friend and the Dallas chairman and CEO of the Dallas Fed, Richard Fisher, for standing up and saying do what's right and that QE3 won't make any difference, and I agree with him 100%. While the banking industry has had a rough time during this financial crisis and recession, you need to realize that banks in Texas have done significantly better. Texas banks have a higher return on assets and a lower percentage of non-current loans and charge-offs than banks nationwide. Loans and leases account for 60% of the total assets of Texas banks compared to 52% nationally. 
The other thing is this extended low interest rate environment is creating extraordinary challenges to individuals who rely on interest income, especially those who are retired. In the industry industry, new laws regulating fracking could undermine the promising future of the natural gas industry. This includes the enormous activity in the Eagleford Shell, which makes San Antonio a global leader in natural gas. If you're in the proximity, if you drive down in South Texas around all this activity, I want you to be careful because you can get run over by a truck. It is amazing the tremendous activity that's going on there. Natural gas has the capacity to make our nation energy independent for the first time in our history. And if, our only, if only our politicians would get out of the way. We've got a tremendous opportunity with natural gas, but our elected officials in Washington just don't seem to understand. And I'm old enough to learn that you can explain something to somebody, but you can't understand it for them. I could go on and on about how government regulation and red tape are, strang are strangling one industry after another in our country. Regulation creates uncertainty, which stalls economic growth. According to an analyst of recent earnings call reports, company executives are postponing hiring and capital investment until they can see some clarity from Washington on the fiscal cliff and possible higher taxes. 2012 is a time of clarity, one way or another. We should receive more of it this year. The health care law has been another lingering drag on the economy. We thought that the Supreme Court would provide some much needed clarity, but the Chief Justice's surprising decision means that significant new Hiring could be delayed until after the November election. The upcoming general election will provide important clarity on future policy decisions, regulation, and the role and scope of government in our society. In addition, elections in Europe are providing direction on the future of the Eurozone. As far as the private sector, U.S. businesses are lean and ready to expand when clarity and consumer confidence returns. You can talk about jobs. You can talk about all these other economic factors. You can show, I can show you a gene graphs. But the outlook for our economy is really all about confidence. And right now, the American people don't have confidence because of what's going on in Washington, and that is the bad news. The good news is confidence can turn quickly. People borrow money when they believe tomorrow will be better than today, and today we're experiencing the opposite. They won't borrow money because they're worried about tomorrow. The middle class is the key to our economic recovery. Poor government policy and overregulation keep pushing down middle class and the folks who make the money and spend the money. According to a recent article in the Washington Post, the proportion of Americans in their prime working years with jobs is smaller than in any time since the 1980s. But for men, that percentage is at the lowest point since the 1940s. Pew Research notes that for the first time since World War II, middle class families finished the decade poorer and lower incomes than they had in 10 years earlier. And medium household net worth dropped from nearly 30% in 2001 to 2010. Jobs are tough to find. It is reported that 83% of the sales associates have college degrees but they're taking whatever job they can. With a string of disappointing job reports, it appears that a, sig a significant hiring is still on hold until there's more clarity about our economy. 
It's hard to effectively tend the gardens of communities when so many people are not working. We must give middle class families and small business owners some breathing room instead of squeezing them. We need to work to bring them along to prosperity like many of us enjoy. Amid this negative economic news, there's a few positive signs. Greenwich Associates notes that small and mid-sized businesses have shifted their primary focus from cost containment to cash flow and growth. Greenwich also says that mid-sized companies are more optimistic about the country's economic outlook than small companies. We at Frost are seeing similar measured optimism among businesses in Texas. Although small businesses continue to remain more cautious than mid-sized and large companies. As I said earlier, we're blessed to be in this business-friendly state of Texas that continues to outperform the U.S. economy. Our job growth is higher than the national average, 2.4% in Texas versus 1.5% in the U.S. Texas unemployment rate, 7.2%, is substantially lower than the U.S. average of 8.1%. Texas is one of only nine states to have recovered all the jobs they lost during the recession. Texas added more than 410,000 jobs since May of 2000. Seven, far more than any other state in the nation. New York was a distant second with gains of 88,000 new jobs. The nation as a whole is still four and a half million jobs below the May 2007 non-farm total. CNBC recently named Texas number one state for business citing the state's infrastructure and low cost of living. And Forbes magazine recently listed 25 best places for business and careers. Five of those 20 cities are in Texas, including San Antonio. If you think state policy doesn't make a difference, let's look at California for a minute. Despite the abundant natural resources, their spectacular weather, business owners and families are leaving California for greener economic pastures like Texas. Since the recession began, California lost the most jobs than any state in the nation, while Texas added the most. In recent months, California has gained some jobs back, as you would expect, because they have the largest population. Even so, California is ranked 48th out of 50 states in the cost of doing business and 43rd in business friendliness. It's a hassle to do business because of overregulation and a lot of red tape. California has the highest state sales tax, an unemployment rate of 10.7%, a state income tax of more than 10% on high income earners, and one third of all of the U.S. Wealth, welfare recipients live in California. Public policy does make a difference and is a factor for the success of this great state. San Antonio is a big part of Texas' success story. The development in San Antonio extends beyond energy and also includes technology, biotech, healthcare, and other industries. Times are good today in Texas compared to just a few decades ago. Many of you can remember the energy, real estate, and banking crisis of the state back in the 1980s. Most of us were just trying to survive. We at Frost learned a lot of valuable lessons during the 1980s that served us well during this economic downturn. We have focused less on cutting and more on growing in the recession. We've had a great success because of hard work, a solid value proposition, and outstanding customer service. In this day and age, when you treat customers the right way, it really sets you apart from the competition. The Gardens of Democracy describe great citizenship as mutual responsibility, putting the long term over the short term, contribution over consumption, 
and living in the community through good deeds. These are all attributes that fit well with our culture at Frost and like the golden rule. And you know, this stuff really isn't that complicated. We all learned it in kindergarten. It's the solution to real clarity in all facets of life. Treating others the way we want to be treated is the secret to success in personal relationships, in business, and in a society. We just need to restore it to be the rule rather than the exception in private industry and in government. Thank you very much.